My name is Joe Nagasne, and I'm a fellow here at the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. Uh, this year's Global Security Forum, uh, Tipping Points and Tripwires, will examine areas of global security in which acting decisively and effectively now will be crucial for securing our national and global communities' interests. On Friday, September 22nd, our panelists will discuss how the war in Ukraine and its implications for the wider European security sphere will pose such a tipping point. Today, I'm honored to be joined by an eminent military scholar uniquely qualified to speak on a different but equally consequential side of that topic, the current state of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Fred Kagan is author of the 2000 report, Choosing Victory, a plan for success in Iraq, and one of the intellectual architects of the successful surge strategy in Iraq. He is the director of the American Enterprise Institute's Critical Threats Project, and a former professor of military history at the U.S. Academy, Military Academy at West Point. Uh, his books range from Lessons for a Long War, co-authored with Thomas Donnelly, to End of the Old Order, Napoleon in Europe, 1801 to 1805. Earlier this month, Dr. Kagan co-authored a piece arguing why, despite the setbacks that we've seen, the Ukrainian counteroffensive can still succeed, titled How the Ukrainian Counteroffensive Can Still Succeed. And just yesterday, Dr. Kagan in the Washington Post, titled Ukraine's Counteroffensive Might Yet Surprise Its Critics. Fred, thank you for joining me today. Great to be with you. So to start off our conversation, um, I think it would be helpful to kind of get a broader view of how the Ukrainian military got to the point where it's facing what it is in the battlefield. So to start off, can you provide for us a quick overview of the events thus far in Russia's invasion that have really shaped what the battlefield looks like now? Sure. <clears throat> well, I mean, I guess the first thing is Russia invaded uh, in, in February, or uh, re-invaded in February 2022, um, having initially invaded, of course, in 2014. Um, and the Russian invasion in February, 20, or re-invasion in February 2022, uh, was on a large scale. It was intended to take full control over uh, Ukraine and replace the Ukrainian government and do a variety of other things. Um, it was badly planned and badly conducted and uh, based on the assumption that the Ukrainians would welcome Russians with open arms, um, which of course turned out not to be the case. And uh, the Russians therefore found themselves in a, a very difficult war that they did not expect and for which they were not prepared. Um, the uh, West, uh, led by the Biden administration, uh, began providing Ukraine uh, with the weapons it needed to start pushing back the Russian or defend against the Russian invasion as it was going on. Um, and uh, with the aid of those weapons and the courage of its people and the skill of the Ukrainian uh, fighters, Ukrainians were able to defeat the Russian drive on uh, Kyiv, uh, push the Russians um, out in the West, and then the Russians uh, reoriented and uh, refocused their energies on holding what they had in southern Ukraine and expanding what they had in the East. That led us <clears throat> all the way through the end of 2022 um, I'm sorry, that, that led us into the summer of 2022. Um, and then uh, the Ukrainians began a series of counteroffensives uh, that had the effect of retaking um, the western part of Kherson Oblast uh, along the lower uh, the Dnipro River, um, and then most of occupied Kharkiv Oblast. Uh, pushing toward the Luhansk, Luhansk Oblast uh, boundary. Um, the Ukrainian counteroffensives culminated uh, in part, in my judgment, because uh, the West was too slow uh, to provide the Ukrainians what they would need, have needed to continue those counteroffensives. Um, and the Russians uh, attempted to regain the initiative, prepared and conducted a large uh, scale offensive operation in the Luhansk uh, Oblast area in, over the winter, you can be forgiven if you had no idea that that was going on because the Russians made virtually no gains in that um, offensive, but it was actually their, meant to be their major effort. Um, instead, as, the, as that offensive just went basically nowhere, um, eyes remained fixed on Bakhmut, uh, where <clears throat> the 
now late Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, was leading uh, Wagner forces in an incredibly bloody fight to take a city with a pre-war population of, a, of under 80,000 um, of no particular operational significance, which he ultimately managed to do. <clears throat> Um, whereupon he immediately announced that he was done, pulled his forces out of the city, um, and the Ukrainians began almost immediately uh, counterattacking around uh, Bakhmut. Uh, in that period, as that was going on, the West was working with the Ukrainians to build up a force for the counteroffensive that Ukraine uh, launched on June 4th of this year. Um, and that counteroffensive is what is is the major operation that is currently ongoing. Uh, Ukrainians launched uh, counteroffensive operations in two parts, uh, in two along two axes in the south. Uh, one is along the axis toward the city of Melitopol, um, and the other was along an axis uh, starting at a near a town called Velika Novosilka and moving toward uh, the city of Berdyansk, um, uh, both on the northern Sea of Azov coast. Um, those, the counteroffensive drives got off to a rocky start. The Russians uh, were better prepared and fought better than um, I had expected them to, um, and then uh, many had, and deficiencies in um, the amount and types of some of the equipment that was available to the Ukrainians, as well as the limitations in the Ukrainians' ability to use that equipment, um, led to uh, initial setbacks. As the Ukrainians found themselves slogging through very, very uh, dense and deep minefields. Um, I've lost all track of time, so it's something like within the past week or so, uh, the Ukrainians managed to push through the minefield that was north of the town of Robotine um, and to seize the town itself. And they have since expanded their um, penetration on that sector and have continued to attack. They've now reached um, what is, in some respects, the main line of the Russian defenses. It's a there's a barrier of uh, tank anti tank trenches and dragon's teeth anti tank obstacles and um, and trench lines that the Ukrainians are currently um, pushing up against. Um, all of which is to say that on the drive toward Melitopol, which is the shortest route to uh, cutting the essential Russian ground line of communication. Um, that's a, that is necessary to support Russian troops uh, in the south. Uh, the Ukrainians have broken through the minefields, are advancing, and are preparing to continue their advance. And the Russian forces appear to be uh, exhausted and struggling to stop them. And that's pretty much where we stand right now as I'm speaking to you. Um, you're muted. Apologies. Uh, something that you alluded to there uh, is some of the capabilities and both in, you know, skills and materiel that is going to be required of the Ukrainians to be successful in this counteroffensive. What sorts of things does any army trying to conduct what the Ukrainians are trying to conduct now? What do they have to do to succeed? <clears throat> so let's first of all be very clear about what this is. This is mechanized maneuver warfare um, of the sort that the uh, US and Iraqis conducted against one another in 1991 and 2003, and of the sort that went on, albeit on a larger scale, in World War II. Um, and the basic requirements for that kind of warfare haven't changed. You need to have heavy tanks that can uh, slug it out with enemy tanks and with enemy anti tank. Uh, weapons um, and bring a lot of firepower with them. You need to have mine clearing equipment and particularly armored mine clearing equipment because as you try to clear minefields, the enemy tries to shoot at you. And so you, you need to have uh, the kind of engineering equipment that can survive um, on or near the front line, which is mine clearing equipment and other engineering equipment to deal with obstacles that the enemy uh, emplaces. 
you need to have adequate artillery. Um, and in the modern world, you need to have both um, sort of conventional artillery, uh, like the, the 155 millimeter um, guns that we've given the Ukrainians. Uh, you also need rocket artillery, um, like the uh, the HIMARS uh, precision systems that we've provided. Um, in principle, you should also have um, aircraft. Uh, you should be able to fly combat missions against uh, enemy positions. You should be able to keep enemy aircraft out of, out of the skies over your own troops. You should be able to use attack helicopters uh, to destroy uh, enemy infantry concentrations or armor. Um, and you should have long range systems um, like the ATACMs, which the US has not provided, um, or the Storm Shadows, which the uh, British have provided, although in the quantities are limited enough that the Ukrainians have to be very, very sparing about how they use those. So when we look at that sort of list of, of equipment, and there's a bunch of other stuff, but that's sort of, in many respects, the most important stuff, um, the Ukrainians only have some of that. Uh, they they did not get uh, enough mine fearing equipment, particularly armored um, uh, engineering equipment. They did not have enough heavy tanks. Um, the U.S. committed to getting Ukraine M1 tanks, but um, the tanks will not arrive until the fall. So uh, the Ukrainians are operating uh, British Challenger tanks and German Leopard 2 tanks, which are good, but they're not as good as M1s for this purpose. Um, and they don't have they don't have enough of them. Um, they don't have uh, the ability to use uh, very many aircraft. Uh, they don't really have the ability to fly their own um, attack helicopters very much. They have not had not been able to stop the Russians from uh, using their own attack helicopters. Uh, and Russian attack helicopters had, until the last few weeks, been taking quite a lethal toll uh, on Ukrainian advancing forces. So the Ukrainians have been operating under quite a considerable handicap in trying to conduct a very, very difficult um, operation. And I think it is important to have all of that context in mind as we evaluate the, the progress that they've made. Yeah, so... Given the handicaps that you're alluding to, the Ukrainians are still seeing some successes on the front lines. Uh, you described how um, the Ukrainians recently have captured the settlement of Rabitina and they're moving towards the main line. So I was wondering, what is a healthy, realistic way of judging success in the Ukrainian counteroffensive? It is, is it taking specific settlements? Is it holding Russian positions in different areas? Is it degrading Russian combat power? In your opinion, what is that? It's a great, it's an excellent way of putting that question. Um, <clears throat> the primary purpose of the Ukrainian drive uh, that we're currently seeing in the South is very likely to be to cut the Russian line of communication. We call it a G-lock, a ground line of communication. It's basically a supply line. In this case, it is a uh, a highway and a and a rail uh, line that runs generally along the northern coast of the Sea of Azov, from the Russian city of Rostov on Don to the uh, northern tip of the Crimean Peninsula. And it is essential for the Russians to retain control of that uh, G lock if they're going to retain forces um, anywhere, the, let me put it this way, if the Ukrainians cut that G-lock, the Russians will find it almost impossible to re, uh, maintain large forces to the west of it. Um, because the lines of communication to and through Crimea are too easily disrupted because we call it a peninsula, but the truth is that Crimea is basically an island in that there's no route that leads from the, quote, peninsula to the Ukrainian mainland that doesn't have a bridge. So that is a that is a very vulnerable uh, position. And then, of course, the, the Russians only, you know, ground access to it is across the Kerch Strait Bridge, which the Ukrainians have been disrupting. So if the Ukrainians can cut the G-lock uh, it's likely that Russian positions to the west of wherever they cut it will collapse. 
So that gets us to what does it mean to cut the G log? Um, basically, having a road requires that you can, having a road that is usable as a main supply line, main supply route, requires that you can safely run large volumes of traffic, including truck traffic, including trucks carrying a lot of ammunition and other explosive stuff uh, back and forth all day without limitation. Same goes for a rail line. So there are several ways of cutting a G-log. One is, of course, if you drive across the road and just take part of it, then they can't use it anymore and, and we're done. But it is also to establish, it is also possible to establish something that both the Russians and the Ukrainians call fire control of a road or an area. And what that means is that you can bring artillery uh, and other uh, weapon systems like that close enough to a road um, or a rail line that you can pound it sufficiently continuously to make it impossible for it to be used in this way. Um, that, so if the, if the requirement is that the Ukrainians cut the road, then you can look at, at where the road runs and you can think about how the places where they might do that. But if you think about the positions from which they would, could establish fire control over the road, you then need to start taking account of the fact that the range of the normal artillery round, the, the norm, normal artillery tube that's being used here, which is a 152 millimeter tube or, or 155 millimeter uh, tube, is about 25 kilometers. Um, you'd want to be closer than that in order to really establish uh, fire control for a whole bunch of even more technical reasons. And I'm sorry for all the technical details here, but. Basically, you'd want to they, they'd want to be somewhere, I would say, within 10 to 15 kilometers of, of the road. So that gives you a, a line north of where the road and the rail line run that you would want to see Ukrainian forces get to if they were going to cut the ground line of communication. I think it's important to keep in mind that it's not there for a point. It's not that they have to take the city of Militopol. Um, it's not that they have to get to any specific location. It's that they have to get ideally to the road and the rail line anywhere, but short of that to within a uh, firing position such that they can prevent the Russians from using the road and the rail line. And that actually gives the Ukrainians quite a lot of flexibility to advance in directions that seem promising rather than having to fight to one specific location. But the only of saying that um, I think the intended objective of this of this counteroffensive operation is to cut that uh, ground line of communication, and it will have been successful if it does that. It will have been fully successful if it does that. I think that it can the Ukrainians can achieve gains that would be successful that are short of that. Um, and specifically, I think they could achieve gains that would set conditions for renewed counteroffensive operations um, later on from much more advantageous positions uh, where the Russians don't have as much depth to defend as they did this time um, and are just in general on a much shorter leash. So I think although full success requires cutting the, the ground line of communication somewhere, I think there are uh, ranges of partial success that would still be very significant that are short of that. First, I will say, please feel free to get as technical as you see fit. That's the point of this program today. Um, so we appreciate it. It seems like you've laid out a kind of dilemma that the Ukrainians are facing in a balance between costs in materiel and personnel and getting gains on the battlefield. Um, and this is something that uh, the Institute of the Study of War and yourself, along with American intelligence and Western intelligence, has assessed is that the Ukrainians started the counteroffensive with a larger scale operation and then made the decision to cut back and go towards a more um, meticulous um, strategy of conducting the counteroffensive. So could you kind of lay out for us what those kinds of dilemmas the Ukrainians are facing right now and how they would make those kinds of decision makings? So <clears throat> the Ukrainians changed their tactics. Um, 
they didn't change the strategy. The, the strategic objectives have remained the same, um, but they changed their tactics. Um, we had trained uh, a number of Ukrainian uh, brigades that we had given Western equipment to um, at training areas in Germany and elsewhere. And we had trained them in Western style, uh, what we call combined arms operations, the ways of integrating uh, tanks and artillery and infantry and aircraft and so forth in uh, conducting offensive operations. Uh, the Ukrainians went through a crash course in how to use our stuff and also how to fight in our style. And they made an initial attempt to implement that those tactics using that equipment at the start of this uh, counteroffensive push beginning on June 4th. Um, and it did not it did not go uh, wonderfully well. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one is that the Ukrainians, we were teaching the Ukrainians a style of warfare for which they did not actually have all of the necessary kit. So our, our style of warfare works for us because we have all of the stuff that we have, but we're not giving the Ukrainians everything that we have. So it's, I'm sure that it was a challenge for our trainers to try to figure out how to teach the Ukrainians what would always have had to have been a hybrid approach, some something short of what we would have done, but still different from what they had become accustomed to. And that I, I'm sure that our trainers did everything they could to figure out what the optima, optimal approach was there, but that's a very challenging undertaking, both for the trainers and for the trainees. Um, and the Ukrainians just frankly were not able to train for long enough on a new style of tactics to be proficient enough at it to be very successful in the first uh, stage of this. Um, but the other thing is that it it seems pretty clear that everybody was surprised by the, the depth and skill with which the Russians had laid their minefields. And so, um, and clearing minefields that are covered by enemy forces is a very, very challenging undertaking. That is a combined arms undertaking. Uh, you need the mine clearing stuff, but you need other other guys around to keep the mine clearing stuff alive. And that's a really very complicated thing to do. <clears throat> so the Ukrainians started trying to do what they'd been taught with what they had and began taking uh, casualties that they regarded as unacceptable. Um, and that they thought would compromise their success. And so they paused and regrouped, and then they resumed uh, an approach that was more similar to tactics that they have been using in the past. Um, and they were decided to conserve the limited amount of Western kit that they had, and also the sol their soldiers, and accept a slower rate of advance uh, that was less costly. Um, that slower rate of advance was nevertheless an advance, and they have worked their way, as I said, through <clears throat> the Russian minefields in one area, <clears throat> and they are um, advancing and they are setting conditions to continue to advance. So the main problem uh, here is that it they adopted an approach that is slower than uh, was initially expected and slower than um, many, you know, many in the West wanted, and uh, they're getting criticized for it. Um, I think this sort of critique of a of a country that is fighting by those who are not fighting is unhelpful. Um, I think it it lacks a kind of strategic empathy. Um, by which I don't mean feeling sorry for them, but I mean actually being able to see the world from the position of the Ukrainian commanders and think about the frameworks within which they need to make decisions um, and recognize that from within those frameworks, things that seem obvious in DC or Arlington are not obvious if you're in Kyiv or uh, Dnipro. So I, you know, I, I think 
we're more we were more surprised by some of these things than we should have been. Um, but in retrospect, none of this is particularly surprising. And what matters right now is that the Ukrainians uh, have chipped a, a hole in the line and are working on the one hand on widening it and on the other hand preparing to go deeper. And if they succeed, then the delays will not have ended up uh, being important. You mentioned something there, and that is, you know, surprise on our part about, you know, how tough an operation, this clearly tough operation has been. Um, do you think that the great success that the Ukrainians have seen in previous counteroffensive, notably in Kharkiv and Kherson, have kind of created some expectations uh, among the general public that probably weren't as realistic as they should have been? Yeah, look, absolutely. Um <clears throat> And that it, there were a couple of, that went in a couple of directions, uh, those expectations. Um, the Ukrainians had worked miracles. And when you've worked miracles a couple of times, you're expected to continue to work miracles. And that's, that's, a, that's a high bar to continue to meet. Um, for my part, I think I underestimated the Russians a bit here. Um, I, I, I did not expect the Russians to have been able to train their guys uh, to conduct what we've been calling at ISW doctrinally sound defensive operations, um, which they have been doing up to this point, um, starting on June 4th. The Russians have been tactically incompetent at a very, very high level. Um, both on the offense and on the defense uh, throughout this war. And they had given very little indication that they were going to be able to turn around that tactical incompetence at scale. It's always possible that, you know, a unit here or there is good, but actually getting a, a, a wide, a large number of units over a large area good is hard. And I frankly underestimated their ability to do that. Um, I, you know, most of us outside of the intelligence community, and I suspect even in the intelligence community, didn't, you know, you're not able to see what, if you could see all the minefields, then, you know, there would be other ways of dealing with them. Um, you know, it's hard to know exactly what, how significant defenses are going to be just looking at them. We were staring at the trench lines. We were looking at, you could see them from space. So, we, you know, we've been staring at the trench lines. Our, our team has mapped them out. Um, others have mapped them out as well. But a trench line is just a trench line. What, you know, the questions that matter are what's in front of it, what's behind it, is it mined, how heavily is it held, what are the soldiers who hold it going to do, how well do they know what they're going to do, is their morale going to be good enough? And a lot of those questions are not answerable until you actually attack. So, uh, yes, the successes in Kherson and Kharkiv had definitely created expectations uh, that were unrealistic, um, and at least on my part, uh, I'm comfortable saying that our attempts to assess uh, how the Russians would perform in this new um, engagement were probably excessively conditioned by our observations of their previous failures, um, and uh, that's a that is a that is a hazard of the of the forecasting business. Yeah, one final question before we kind of shift our gaze away from the front line uh, to end off our talk. Um, you mentioned before, and uh, the Institute for the Study of War constantly keeps tabs on this uh, clearly in their daily summaries of the Russian invasion, about the crucial factor that is Russian morale is on the front lines. Um, could you detail for us a little bit what you could glean from you know the open source reporting that you do about how the Russian morale and capabilities are at the moment, what direction is that going in and what are the implications of that for the defense? <clears throat> Russian morale is, is predictably lousy. Um, this has not been a good war for Russia or Russians. And there's, there's very little about this war for a Russian soldier to be enjoying. Um, and we have seen various indications 
uh, reported by the Russians themselves, which is where we get most of this information. Um, and I'll preempt an obvious question. We do evaluate the information we get from them to determine how much of it is an information operation and what of it we think is actually true. And I think we're generally pretty good at distinguishing between Russian information operations and things that are actually true. Um, so what I'm going to tell you is drawn from Russian sources, run through our filter to give you what we think is actually true and not what is just Russian information operation. Um, doesn't mean we got it right, but just to say that we at least done due diligence to try. Um, and look, there are a lot of problems with the Russian army. I could spend another whole 45 minutes talking with, with you about problems with the Russian army, but it is uh, an army that does not take care of its soldiers, that doesn't encourage initiative, um, and that generally doesn't particularly do well at rewarding competent officers. And so the Russian officers do a lot of stupid things and they get a lot of their guys killed doing a lot of stupid things. And that gets their guys predictably angry. And we've seen various manifestations of that anger and they range from Russian units issuing public video appeals and complaints about their conditions to reports of um, instances of attacks on, on Russian commanders. And then we had a slew of reports. It, well, we initially had a confirmed report that the commander of the army, the 58th Combined Arms Army that was is responsible for defending in the sector the Ukrainians are now advancing in, who is responsible in all likelihood for developing this skillful defense and training his guys to fight well, was fired. Um, and that generated ripple effects and a whole bunch of additional reports about rumored firings and so forth of other commanders, some of which were uh, confirmed to be false, others of which were not confirmed to be true. Um, and all of that points to bad morale. All of that points to problems. Um, bad morale always degrades combat power to some extent. Um, but at the end of the day, soldiers can have bad morale and continue to fight competently, which is what a lot of the Russian soldiers in this area have been doing. The reason to keep an eye on the morale really is because at a certain point, when things start to go badly enough for demoralized troops, they can break. And if they do, then you could see a uh, rather unexpected and significant um, Ukrainian advances. Uh, so we are keeping an eye out on the morale and looking for indications that the Russia, it's actually beginning to have, you know, to manifest visible effects on the battlefield. I don't think that we are at the point where I can point to any specific effects that we've yet seen. So we're continuing to monitor it um, it continues to be, we continue to have indicators that it's bad, but although I'm sure that's degrading the performance of these Russian troops, we're not yet seeing the indicators that, well, let me put it this way, Russian troops haven't yet broken. Um, and I don't think that we would particularly see indications that they will break until they actually do. Mm -hmm. So pivoting away from the front line uh, for a little bit, um, we have seen throughout the counteroffensive a campaign to strike um, Russian logistics lines in Crimea. Uh, you alluded to at the beginning attacks across the Kerch Bridge, which are you know persistent and have been ongoing for months. Um, and just yesterday, we saw um, what Ukraine reported to uh, be as a, an actual landing on Western Crimea of Ukrainian troops. Um, could you detail for us the relevance of Crimea to the current counteroffensive and Ukraine's broader strategic goals? Sure. Look, first of all, it, <clears throat> the landing yesterday was a raid. Um, I think it's important not to overstate the significance of that. The Ukrainian troops landed, did whatever they did. I have no idea what they actually did. Got back on their boats and left. Um, I don't want to trivialize it, but it's it's important to understand that you know that was that was a raid and they're gone. 
I'm not surprised they were able to land either, by the way. If you take a look at the coastline of Crimea and think about what the requirements for the Russians would be to ensure that no Ukrainians could land anywhere, anywhere on the coast of Crimea, they could probably contribute, you know, position their whole army to do that and not do anything else. So just for context on that. Um, Crimea is incredibly important. I talked about how the GLOC across the northern uh, Sea of Azov coastline is essential because Crimea is not good enough. The That GLOC also isn't good enough by itself. The Russians also need to be able to use uh, Crimea as they have been using it. So they've turned Crimea basically into a huge ammunition depot, uh, rear logistics area, a uh, fuel storage site, concentration point for troops, base for air defense systems and uh, long range systems of other sorts and various other things. Crimea is sort of an unsinkable aircraft carrier for uh, for the Russians. Um, and it is incredibly important to them to be able to use it for those purposes. The Ukrainians successfully uh, disrupted traffic flow across two of the three road bridges that connect Crimea to the mainland um, for about seven to 10 days. Um, and they also disrupted one of the rail bridges leaving the Russians with only one road, road bridge for a time. Um, that generated the predictable traffic jams um, that we've seen. Um, the closer the Ukrainians get, the more easily they can disrupt the Russian movement across those bridges. Um, and the more problematic will be the Russian defense. Um, because as you start to have your your supplies disrupted you start to have to ration you start to have to be more thoughtful about you know when you fire artillery and when you drive and a bunch of other things and if you think about the dynamics of this those are kinds of decisions the russians need to be making as the ukrainians are advancing through their lines and for key positions that this ties into the morale point because the fear of being cut off, the fear of having supplies cut off, the fear of not being able to escape, all of those fears in the face of a successful armored advance contribute to panic. And that those fears contributing to panic layered on bad morale is are factors that can lead forces to break. I keep coming back to this because we've seen Russian troops break before. This was the story of the Kharkiv counteroffensive. The Ukrainians did maneuver. The Ukrainians, we now know, we have had four brigades uh, driving against Russian forces. They achieved surprise. The Russian forces didn't think that they were going to be attacked there. And in fact, the Russian forces there did panic and they fled, leaving behind almost two tank regiments worth of Russian tanks, um, making Russia at the time probably the largest donor of armored vehicles to Ukraine of any country in the world, uh, because Ukrainians just, just hopped in the tanks and and, and used them. Um, so we've seen Russian troops break before at scale. Now, OK, I think we need to be mindful of not expecting the Russians to do the same thing here. And I didn't because they were not going to be surprised in the same way. But and it's not a peculiarity of Russian troops. Any troops will break under circumstances that shock them sufficiently. So the dynamic that I suspect that, that would be optimal for Ukraine anyway would be that as the counteroffensive ground forces are rolling forward, uh, the Ukrainians begin further campaign to disrupt Russian ground lines of communication from Crimea to the mainland as they start to come into range of the road from Rostov to Crimea begin to disrupt that, all of that together creates a sense of panic that leads Russian forces to break, and then the Ukrainians would be able to flow, you know, more rapidly to the sea. That would be the optimal scenario. I'm not forecasting it. I'm not saying that that will happen, but that it's neither, I think, can we rule out, rule that out as a, as a live possibility. Well, 
there are so many interesting branching off questions that we, we could talk about here, but unfortunately we, we only have so much time. Uh, I'd like to end our discussion on kind of a reflection about our role specifically as, you know, people of the, the American public um, in allowing the Ukrainians to maintain their counteroffensive. Um, so while support for Ukraine is still widespread um, in the American public, there are vocal and prominent individuals who are really seriously critiquing, critiquing our continued support for Ukraine. Um, the Biden administration recently just requested uh, around 23 billion, maybe 20.3 billion, don't quote me on that, um, for continued uh, Ukrainian support. Um, you are very are very vocal individual and have been on the record many times in the past about why we need to continue supporting Ukraine and why it's in our interest. For us today, could you explain to us why it is so vital that we continue our support? I love that you said that. Yes, I am a very vocal individual. Um, <clears throat> look, Ukraine, it, it, it is a vital national security interest of the United States for Ukraine to win this war. Uh, Russians launched an unprovoked war of aggression that is in fact a genocidal war in February 22. The purpose of this war from Putin's perspective, and he's made this very clear, is to eradicate uh, Ukraine as an ethnicity, as an identity, and as a state. And that is, that is a genocidal undertaking. There is therefore an absolute moral imperative in my view, which I regard as a, as a vital interest because I think that um, American interests involve defending our values. And there are few values that we can have uh, in the world abroad more important than resisting genocidal wars of aggression. Um, but I'm prepared to make a purely interest-based case as well. Uh, which is that the other purpose of this war from Putin's perspective was to break NATO, to separate the US from Europe, and to demonstrate that uh, the West would not support uh, his intended victims. And in doing so, he roped Xi Jinping into this effort also. You may remember shortly before this war began, Xi Jinping was all in on this effort. Why? Because it's very much in Xi's interest for that principle to be established, that those with power who act aggressively will not be met with meaningful resistance. Or at this point now, that they may be met with initial resistance, but the resistance will fade. And if they simply persevere, they will eventually be able to get what they desire. That's why it's so important to see this fight all the way through to the end. Because allowing Putin a partial victory here, and it is far too strong to say that he has already lost, um, because he, is, he has gained a lot of territory that he did not have for this invasion. And he, he, Russia is in far more advantageous position for a future invasion, or even simply to uh, continue to cripple Ukraine. Um, and the lines that it's on now than it was uh, before the invasion. And that is a gain, even if it's not worth the price he's paid for it. Allowing Putin to, to pull any sort of victory, however partial, out of this invasion, because our attention wanes, because we lose our will to back Ukraine, will send a message to Xi Jinping as well that we may resist initially, but as long as he keeps going, uh, he will eventually get what he wants. And all of our potential adversaries around the world will take note. Um, I don't think that anyone is particularly you know, going to be motivated to, to take up arms and fight and die for the rules-based international order. All right. That's, I get it. That's a, that's a, that's a meaningless international relations phrase that, um, you know, we academics toss around with each other. But it does have a meaning behind it, which is actually important because the flip side, the, the antonym of rules-based international order is a Hobbesian war of all against all. 
And that's the world that we are looking at if we allow to be established the principle that Putin is trying to establish here, that predators may freely attack prey and that as long as they are brutal and determined enough, they will eventually get to eat their prey. That is a world that no American alive today has seen and no American alive today should want to see. Mm. And th that, that is the most powerful interest-based argument that I can offer you about why it is so important for us to help Ukraine win this war. And by win, I mean liberate all of the strategically vital territory that the Russians have taken. Um, certainly everything that they've taken since February 22. I think that they, Ukrainians also need to recover Crimea, but that's, a, that's an argument that we can have for another day. Mm -hmm. Wonderfully well said, Dr. Kagan. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today and sharing your expertise with us. Um, I know I'm certainly going to be, you know, racking my head with uh, especially those last ideas that you gave us. So again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.